So thank you all for joining us. That was really powerful. Um, I'm Chris Green, the Executive Director of the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Program. And I'd like to offer our warm welcome to Victor Kosakowski, the Director of Gunda. Um, I'd like to start just by thanking you, Victor, for creating such a innovative and emotionally impactful film. Uh, thank you for your time and interest. And unfortunately, I cannot listen to your warm welcome. And maybe one day I will come, come over and we'll talk in, purple, in person. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys, about it. Thank you for watching. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm, so, I'm so happy that Neon that took the film and has a, because it's, you know, there are sometimes you make in films, you consider like an art and you say, okay, some intellectuals saw it and some people came to you, how you and say such a great art, but, and then you're happy, but this particular film, you really want that people watch it, right? All people watch it as much as possible, as many as possible. So I hope <clears throat> Neon, for me, Neon is doing a great job and, 16th of, uh, of April is going in cinemas in the US and then around the planet. So that's that's a good for me. Finally, I can share my view to animals to, to, to all people around the world, yeah. I currently manage a farm that's been in my family for 183 years. And as a child, when there were animals present, uh, it was the piglets that first captivated me, uh, allowing them to see, allowing me to see them as unique individuals with distinct personalities and, and sort of having a value beyond just the weight of their flesh, uh, which is how they were valued. Um, my understanding is that you have a similar origin story in caring about these issues and these, these animals. Can you explain that story and what motivated you to make this deeply engaging film? Yeah, that's true. That's really true. Uh, yeah, so I was, um, you know, I'm a city boy. I born in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, and it's maybe one of the most beautiful city in the planet. But, <clears throat> but in age four, for some reasons, they sent me in few to for a few months to a countryside, and it was a very cold winter. So, and people I I used to live with, they they took a piglet they had inside the house. The piglet was one month old and I was like four years old. And we were together like maybe one month or two and became best friends, like running together, enjoying life and making mess in the, in the house. And, and I knew he understands me. I knew he feels what I feel. I knew he's very clever. I knew he is happy when I'm happy. He feels when I'm sad. And, and he knew when when my relatives were angry that because we made a mess, he knew he, he knew that uh, we, we made too much. So, and then in the Christmas time, he became a dinner for for my family, for my relatives. So, and for me, it was like big tragedy. Like, I I I kind of refused to eat meat. I refused to talk to them for for a while because, like, they kill my friend, you know. And, and it, what for me was kind of interesting. If I look back now, it means I was first child who who decided to be vegetarian in Soviet Union. You know? So, and I, miraculously, I didn't eat meat since since four. You know, I didn't eat meat, fish, or, or, or chicken since four. Yeah, and um, yeah, this was strong impact on my life. And and then. I always wanted to make this movie actually, because you know, I'm, I, I'm in life, I am privileged to know great filmmakers, like really top of the world and great writers. I know a couple of Nobel prize winners. I know best compo few best great composers. I know great musicians, like top level of musicians. I was really privileged in my life to know those people and and I know they, they watched my film recently and oh, Victor, great movie. And then they go to and to restaurant with me and they order a hamburger or something like with meat. And, and I don't understand how it, how it connect, how it possible to, you saw, you saw animal who suffer, right? You saw Gunda who suffering like hell with this who, who talked, who came to the, in the end to the screen and he, who obviously said to you, what are you doing to me? Why did you took my kids? 
And after this, you can go. <coughs> so I knew, <coughs> sorry. So I knew all the time that people could be very high educated, could be very intelligent, and they still don't make this simple link. Even they do have animals at home. They do have cats or dogs and they love them. And they understand. They will never imagine eating them, right? They know that dogs are intelligent, uh, understand them, feel them, and best friends, and love them. And they will never imagine eating them. At the same time, they don't do this link to other animals. They don't, they don't look around and, I don't know, it's, we are in Harvard, probably I can say something like more tough. I believe it's it's a long tradition. Like you know, in antique, when people were saying in antique that uh, the man a, a man is a measure of everything, right? Do you know this quote? The man is a measure of everything, and and then in Bible, the first page is written this wrong wrong line, which is probably cost us such pain <laughs> when when it's. In the first page written that God made light and darkness, earth and, and water and, uh, and, and uh, plants and animals in the day five, God made people to rule over it. And this caused us such a big pain because why is we supposed to rule planet? Animals much before us appear in the planet, much before, and we just decided to dominate it. And I, what, I, what I really don't understand, okay, you can believe in God or not believe in God, it's your choice. But if you don't believe in God, you believe in evolution, then, right? It's like, but evolution will not stop today, right? Evolution will continue. And it means obviously, will appear creature more clever than us and maybe more aggressive than us, more who will dominate the planet and they will probably eat our kids, right? So it's, easy, it's so easy, right? And if you believe in God, then you believe in the soul. But if you watch Gunda, Gunda, Gunda does, she, she has soul as well. So it's, for me, it doesn't make any sense that people don't have this simple connection. And, and I, I just want to understand, for me, most important is that we allow ourselves to kill. We allow ourselves act of killing. I like very much the Leonardo da Vinci's quote he said 500 years ago already, like to kill animal, to kill human, same, just act of killing, nothing else, act of killing. And we allow ourselves to do this. And to kill billion, billion pigs a year, and then to cut them, to freeze them, to transport them. It's just a nightmare, right? And, and I just always think like this. I, I cannot forget this image. It, it kept it in my mind when I was doing it. In the, I, I imagine myself like 100 years old. And imagine in the U.S., you eat more than 100 kilograms of meat per year. You In the U.S., in Europe, tiny bit less, but in the U.S., between 100, 120 kilograms of meat per year. Each of you. If you live 100 years, for example, right? So, and you die in the 100 years old, behind you will be two huge mountains. One from plastic, like pyramid, empire still building high. And another one, 100 animals, like a skeleton, like bones of 100 animals, huge mountains from, it's an absurd, right? Yeah. It's just absurd, it's so simple. Mm -hmm. We still believe, I don't understand. Well, given that most of the viewers are likely still reeling from the ending of the film, uh, I'd like to jump right to asking a couple of questions about that. Um, it, it's pretty much impossible to deny the emotion of Gunda frantically calling out for her stolen babies, then like holding her breath, trying to hear a response that never comes. Um, her ultimate resignation is also palpable. Um, in the United States, the average captive bred mother pig has three to four litters before being killed. Um, and at Iowa State University claims that it's economically most efficient to breed mother pigs for six to nine litters. The precision with which the tractor is backed up to the barn to prevent any escape by the piglets indicates that this was not the first such occurrence. 
do you know how many times this has happened to Gunda? H had she personally already been through this tragic experience before? She, as far as I understood, she made it six. Uh, before me, she made it six times already. Wow. And after me, I guess two or three more. And now she's retired. But of course, um, she's lucky one because first of all, she lives in a privileged farm, which 99% of them live in concrete cement floor, right? They don't have opportunity to dig, right? They're just born in, in the cage and, and then they, they live their short life in the cage. But she is privileged because she has this farm. They have 20 meters of land for each pig. So it means she has freedom to walk and, and to, to, to dig. Most, you see, most of the day, she's just digging, digging, digging mm -hmm. ground. And, and uh, now, as far as she became kind of famous, so the, the owner of the farm decided that she's not going to die. Because it's actually, as you know, they can live 20, 30 years, but we kill them when they, the piglets are kill eight months old, right? The mom can live a tiny bit longer, but, but piglets can kill bet, between eight and one year old. So it means um, they have short life. At least one will be, <sighs> at least Gunda will stay until her natural death. Yeah. Right. One of the most powerful moments comes as you earlier referenced where Gunda looks directly into the camera before giving up hope for her babies and going back into the barn. Um, it reminded me of Godfrey Reggio's film, Anima Mundi, which featured several long shots of various wild animals similarly piercing the lens with their held gaze. She also seems to run right towards you and your crew uh, at several parts at that end, as if almost to seek your help or assistance. Um, can you describe that moment, filming it, and what it what it took to capture it? Speech, I didn't know that Retro made his film because he's quite example for. I remember he, he his film Kayanis Katsi was very powerful for my life, and and I still I still respect him a lot. And I didn't watch this particular film, but what you mentioned, yeah, this moment, um, you know. I'm such a strange filmmaker. I, I don't I don't consider filmmaking as a storytelling. I always say film is not to tell story, but to show something. And uh, maybe story, maybe not. So it means I want to show something and I need to film this episode and it's crucial for my life and I want to share this. But in order that you proceed it, correctly, I need to prepare you, yourself. I need to prepare my viewers. So it means I need to film something before and put it in, a, in such order that you, they will be ready to watch this moment. If I will just show this moment itself without preparation, they will not feel what, I, what, what they're supposed to. So that's why for me it was important to show relationship of Gunda with her kids that she made a tough decision to kill one of them because he will not make it. And then she cares about others and, and she is really good mom and, and they're friends and they're running together, enjoying life and, and then they separate. So, and of course, in, there are many aspects of cinema language here, but most of the time in such situation, if you look fiction films, especially Hollywood movies, you can say, okay, such dramatic episode, we need to make zoom into the portrait and put uh, music of Williams or, or something like Schindler series, something like this violence and people cry watching. So, and I said, no, I should not do it. I should not. First of all, I illuminate voiceover. Second, I said, I illuminate music. I want you to watch yourself without my push. And third, I said, I will not make any Zoom. And I, I bet I was sure she will come herself. I was sure in the end of her struggle, and this is magic of, of cinema. My team did not believe me that it would happen. My team said, how she will come? Why would she come? And I said, because there is no one around. We spent two months with her. She considers us friends, right? 
She, and there is no one else. She is alone. She, must, she will come. So we, we decided not to zoom, not to disturb her. We decided just to wait in the corner. And she, she came. And her speech was so direct and so clear, right? So, and I heard behind me that my team is crying. They're crying. They, they are young people between 25 and 35. And I heard them crying because it was so clear that what she's saying to us was so obvious. And especially the last one, you know, the last look when she, when she almost, when she, when she, like before she came to the door, she took, she looked kind of saying, ah, you're hopeless. You're hopeless. There is nothing to talk to about with you. Like, it was so clear that I was, I was like, my, my skin was totally goose. And uh, yeah, because it's, and you know, it's not about only suffering and struggle, but also, did, did you notice how they experience freedom? How they're happy when, how cow, cows are happy when they're just, they're almost dancing. When, or how they, the bull, huge bull came to the tree and instead of eating leaves, he was just mm-hmm. breathing it, right? And cow, little cow, she never experienced any freedom. She came to the grass and she, she just smelled it. Like, you breathe, breathe this smell of the fresh grass. And, you know, and chickens, they never been outside. Their whole life were staying in this box, never been outside. And then they came out and they look. And they, they look, they never see so sky, right? They never touch grass before. And for them, it was like they're touching grass, like if you will touch boil water, right? like, like in these emotions, right? Everything was. So, and you see even chickens, she, that one leg chicken, she was, she, you see that she thinks, right? She, she not just stupid one, as we normally say about chickens. She, you can see she's making decision to go left or right. She's making decision if she with one leg can, can make this or better go another way or she, because this obstacle in front of her, she, she was measuring if she can make it or not. And so, and you, you see, it just obviously they have everything what we have, but we reject to think, we refuse to accept it. We refuse it just because it's not convenient for us. Yeah. It's not convenient for us to accept that they are, they have rights to be here, same as we do. They have full rights to be happy here, same as we do. No, we we refuse. We refuse. We don't want accept it. Yeah. You strike a pretty solid balance between the the natural aspects of their lives and the. The reality of being bred for human purposes. Um, the first such instance is right after the birthing when the, the tag in Gunda's ear is revealed for the first time. Um, there's several uncomfortable moments like the one you just mentioned where it's natural for the viewers to feel a sort of deep empathy for these for the less fortunate piglets, uh, such as the newborn that Gunda was stepping on and the, the one with the club foot who is sort of having trouble competing to nurse. Um, while watching those scenes, my instinct was to inquire like how those piglets fared or if they even survived. But later, once their ultimate fate is revealed, one wonders what's even the point if they did live, whether uh, or whether they may actually have been spared a much worse fate. Um, so what, what are your thoughts about that contrast? And did you feel any impulse to try and help during those instances? You know, when I was a kid, I when I was a teen, no, I was actually 12. I, before that, I was making, I was making pictures. Like I started at seven and eight. I was making pictures of flowers or dogs and on pigeon on the street. And, and then when I was already 10 and 11, 12, I was already <clears throat> making, making photos of animals in the forest and trees and, and uh, frogs and birds and and elks and like I was trying to, and then when I was like fourteen, I 
I um, I decided to make some. You, I was already maybe even thirteen. I was tall enough, so I made a summer job to to make some money for to buy in the the tele tele lens for my photo camera. So, and my job was to be uh, to look for cows like on the field. So, like how do you call it, pastor? Pastor, uh, how do you call it in English? Pastor. The one. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I just wanted, I, my job was, because there are probably wolf around, or they may, might go somewhere in the wrong direction, I have to just look, it was like, it was a collective, co co it was communist time, it was collective um, a village, and, and the, I, I don't remember, maybe we have 40, 40 cows, and I have to look I was, I just have to be with them all day. And one day I knew that tomorrow, three or four of them will be taken to slaughter house. And what I did is I pushed them to the forest, those four, I pushed them to the forest. So when I came back and I said to the boss of the collective farm, I said, unfortunately, there are four cows, they disappeared. And he understood probably immediately what I did. And he said, aha, it means you want to be a nice guy, right? So you want to save their life. And do you know what happened next? The wolves will eat them. Are you happy now? Are you happy now? And then he started laughing. And I said, what are you laughing? And he said, look back. And I looked, turned back, and the cows, those cows came back themselves. They knew the way back to the farm. So, you know, and I realized I'm, <clears throat> when you filmmaker, for example, if you on, on Titanic, right? And you on Titanic, you have different possibility to behave. You can run to the, to the least small boat, jump there and push away everyone, or you can support, women and children to help them and be last one or you can play violin and uh, or and i guess my job is to be filmmaker my job is to stay the last one and film everything until i go to the water because i cannot the only how i can help the world is to film it its reality yeah if i will if I will help those those particular piglets, I will not help the other ones who lives in the next farm, right? And the other ones who lives in today, who is dying today in after. But my job is to show what I can see and others don't want to see or not able to see. You know, filmmaking is is a job that you see what others don't not able to see or don't want to see decided not to see that's why of course it's it's always it's always question every shooting every film every film you accidentally film something and then you want to run to help and then you ask yourself is it my job or is it my my job to film as it is and show truth not to that especially in editing you can always cut it out right you can always cut this element and then i said no i'm not doing vegan propaganda i cannot judge Gunda. she lives here pigs li lives live here a million years before human i cannot judge her i cannot say oh she she did wrong right she killed her baby because of her reasons she she made it she knew she is killing it because she, the kid the kid was ill he was not doing well. He did not fight for nipple. He did not even came to her to, to drink milk. So she knew he will not make it. So she decided, and I cannot interfere with this, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, you do seem to very deliberately present uh, an unvarnished and unsentimental view of these animals' lives. Uh, trying to portray their experience as honestly as possible. This includes both the joys of the, the piglets drinking from the rain, 
um, and Gunda seeming to grow weary of nursing as the piglets got older. Many filmmakers feel the need to either overly sentimentalize animals or often to demonize them. Can you tell us about your approach and, and how you <clears throat> it differs from much of what has been done in previous animal films? Yeah, you're right. There are two kind of animals films. Uh, uh, first of all, there are many films when they are filmed in slaughterhouses. And I said, it will not help me because uh, my goal is to see animals how they are. My goal is to show how they are. And what this is what exactly we don't want to accept. This is number one. Number two, it's a wrong idea to look to them from our point of view. And like, for example, we, we measure intellect of animals, right? We, we know, we do this. And we say, number one is chimpanzee, number two is pig, number three, three is dolphin, then whale, then elephant, then crow, then dog, then horse. Okay, we made this. But sorry, crocodile does not allow you to measure his intellect, right? So maybe he is much more intelligent. And by the way, tree, tree does not move. So tree, if something happened, tree has to, he, tree cannot run away. He, tree has to deal with changing and obstacles and changing climate and changing uh, circumstances. Tree doesn't have brain, you don't see it, but tree has an intellect. Tree doesn't have ear, but has, can listen. Tree doesn't have eyes, but can see. For example, you and me, we have only five cents. Tree has 20. You know, we are always looking to creatures around us from our perspective. And we think, oh, they, they, don't, they cannot make computer or they cannot play computer games they are not intelligent enough. But excuse me, maybe it's not, necess not, not necessary. They probably understood already that it is the wrong way to play computer. Maybe they know this is, because actually what we want to achieve, if we, if we forget about everything now, if you just ask two main goals of people are trying to achieve, people are trying to live longer, right? Excuse me, three can live over a thousand years. Even shark can live 500 years and Greenlandic shark 700 years. Mm -hmm. The medusas, some medusas can live 1,000 years. So, excuse me, we want to achieve what they already have. Oh, we, another thing, we want to achieve, we want to, read, uh, kind of, uh, we have this gene of ages, right? We, when we all, we have arthritis, we have hepatitis, we have uh, something, Excuse me, look to crocodile. No one can tell when 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 you see two crocodile fight and one died in a fight, then you look to crocodile, you never will tell how old is crocodile. He doesn't have any sign of age. None. And we just we just be want to achieve it. They already did it. So Evolution, evolution, they made them in a way they stay here. They learn how to do it. And if you look to, to our history, you can say clearly, we disappear a few times already, right? Look, if you dig a little bit in Italy, if you read a little bit in Mexico, in Peru, in, you see, aha, it was another civilization. And where they are? Mm -hmm. They disappear. Why they disappear? Maybe because they were so stupid as we are. Maybe because they were too arrogant, not respecting nature. Maybe that's why they disappear. But crocodiles still here. Yeah. Crocodile is still here, and and pigs are still here. So I wouldn't be so sure. We have to measure animals from our perspective. We, I give you another example. I made a movie about. People, I made a movie about a child who never seen himself in the mirror. So when my kid was born, I decided that he will not see himself until he's clever enough to understand reflection. Hmm. So I block all mirror in the apartment. I block, I put some painting on the windows. 
I even changed spoons in my apartment. Then I put plastic one. When we were on the street, I was two meters ahead, checking there is no reflection in the car or somewhere. Yes. And when he was two years old, I came with a mirror in his room and I started filming his reaction. It took him about 20 minutes before he said, oh, it's me. And it took him quite time to understand concept of mirror when left becoming right. I, I, will show, I will shock you now. Pig, a little piglet need one look to understand it. One look. Human baby needs to, <laughs> to look around. Pig just one look and understand. Aha, left is right, right is left. And go accordingly. Yeah. You see, it's a, and it's proved by scientists in UK. It's proved. So we are so arrogant. We always believe we are the smartest one. We always believe, but what we achieve is our smart, what we achieve is our intellect. What? We achieve torturing, right? Yeah. Animals do not torture each other. We made concentration camp. They don't do concentration camp. We achieve Kalashnikov. They don't do Kalashnikov. We made nuclear bomb and atom bombs. They don't do anything like this. We made Novichok. They don't do Novichok. They don't, they kill each other, yes. With possibility to be killed, <laughs> right? And they kill by necessity. And we kill for pleasure sometimes. We have a, a warrior hunting with, with lands, right? And we kill by billions, by billions. Okay, okay, last century we were killing people by millions. Now we are killing animals by billions. So this is the point, right? We, we have to just wake up and say, aha, our main activities is just killing. Yeah. Better to accept it. Part, part of what makes this film so unique is is the window you provide into the animals' everyday lives. Um, as most of them seem quite oblivious to the camera, uh, the cows being some of the few to, to be the most curious. Can you talk about how you filmed in such a way to achieve both that closeness but distance so that it, it, it seemed that you weren't interfering with what you were trying to capture? It's very interesting. It's a little bit pro too, too professional, but okay. So when I came and I met Gundra, she was immediately friendly. She actually came to me herself. And I said to producer, oh, she's Meryl Streep. She's communicated very, yeah. And then I came to her house. I learned that she was already pregnant and she will give birth in a month's time. So I came to her place, to her barn, and I, I draw it. And then I create similar one, but I designed similar one, but with possibilities that my lens inside, my crew, my camera outside, but lenses inside and lens can move 360 degree. Uh -huh. So it was a little bit complicated, but we achieved it. So this is why we never interrupt this. We, she, we never disturb her. We never did cross her movement. We never, and especially, especially of the when moment when she gave birth. So of course you don't want to, to, to be present there, but camera was outside, we were outside, but lens was quite easy flying around there. And uh, but then another important moment was we decided to dedicate time to them, right? So every morning we were coming four o'clock in the morning before they wake up. So we already, we put camera, we already were, and then they came out, she came out first. She came to me, she looked to me, she smelled me, then she smelled my team. And then she made like, hru, 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 and then kids appear. So and when they appear, they, they also kind of, they already took us as a part of their environment. So, so they saw us every day. So we are not, we were not danger. In other, in other episodes where we made in sanctuaries, which make us happier in, in terms of 
because chicken, you cannot come closer to chicken, a normal farm. They will run away, right? Or normal chicken will never allow you to film here like this, you know? And cow as well, a bull as well. So, but in sanctuaries, animals and chickens, they understand that humans are good. So they understand that humans are not dangerous. <laughs> and so this cow is, in my film, she's 30 years old. So yeah. you normally never see cow such old because you normally, you never see grandmother cow. So, but I can come close with camera to this car and she accept me because they know that people who live around them in sanctuaries, they are nice people and humans are nice. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, what is also good about this movie for me was that I knew, I knew that I'm making a movie not to have a message, but it happens that it changed me. It changed me. I, I, I already cannot forget it. I cannot say I did not see it. I saw it. I saw it clearly. And I also met great people who dedicate their life to help animals in this strange circumstances where there's animals mistreating everywhere. So I met those people who make in sanctuaries and, and, and buy them from slaughter house and give them second chance to live. And this is amazing. Like everywhere in the world now appears such places, especially in UK and um, which we film in UK. We film Nor uh, Norway, we film Gunda and uh, in UK, we film chicken and, and cow. So, you know, it's just um, nice to know that there are good people around. Nice to know. You know, with some of those other animals that are portrayed in the film, with the hens, you really zoomed in and focused specifically on their feet um, and their movement through the brush had almost a feel of like a Vietnam War movie as they slowly picked their way through the environment. Um, <laughs> So you said that they were released from cages uh, and we see that they were missing some feathers. So as you noted, was this the first time they were feeling that natural world with those feet and what went into your approach filming those segments? Yeah, exactly. So what happened is I knew that like two times in a year or three times a year uh, in this part of U UK, um, some people come into uh, they kind of allowed to buy um, in slaughter house, they allowed to buy chickens who are supposed to be killed this day. So, so they came in from cage, in the cage, from the place they live, and they lived in the cage. So, uh, all together, so they never experienced any freedom. So, and I knew that I want to feel, film this moment when they go out. And you know what is interesting, maybe for, for your university is interesting. And I cannot include it into the film because then the film will be longer and a little bit about something else. But when we opened the door, they didn't go out hmm. very long, about one hour. Wow. One hour. So they did not know freedom. And they was not able to go out. And I will tell you, only one of them was brave enough after one hour, he, the, she came out, she came out. And then, then others were afraid. And another one make one step and then came back and again was staying there. So, so freedom, it's also a metaphor of our, you know, if I look to my country, for example, Russia, and I don't understand how we can continue to be slaves. Slavery was canceled 1,160 years ago, but we still continue to, to be slaves. We still, and I talk to some people uh, in my country and say, okay, the cage is big, the chain is long, we can survive like this. So you see, it's, um, not everyone needs freedom. Not everyone wants freedom. Not everyone, but those chickens, 
So it took them quite a while before they, they go out and then they were discovering this world. That's why I was very precise and very precise with, with feet and with eyes. And I wanted to film close-ups also because you see they're prehistorical, right? So you see they're kind of from dinosaur era and we put them in cages. Right? This is also ridiculous, right? So they are kind of obviously much, much older than us. And we dominate so much that we put them in cages, which is like, mm. and of course there are, you know, you're making movies and if you don't have voiceover, you need to be attractive visually, right? You need to, you need to make people watch your movie, right? Because 90 minutes to watch without words, you need to give something to people they watching like first time in life. And they, because I, I, I know no one saw chicken <laughs> legs like this, feet like this, right? No one even imagined it. So, but you see how, how, how expressive every, even you feel emotion, even the way she, she, change position of fingers, right? You feel what she feels. Then that's what it is. By the way, I don't know, you you probably know more than me about it. Human, we are animals, right? So, and nature actually taught us to, to look and we forgot about it. But this is what struck me about, and shocked me about American documentaries, I respect all filmmakers. Anyone can do whatever he wants. I just believe we don't use the power of our eyes. Our eyes are big computer. Animals, for example, in Savannah, in Africa, or if they run and they see someone, they know in immediate, immediately, is it friend or enemy? If they, or, they have to run or they can do attack or they have to be neutral, friendly, same with us. We need only four seconds to understand the new person you meet on the street. You need only four seconds to understand is it friend or enemy, four seconds. And you need only 17 seconds to understand if you're gonna make love with this person or never, 17 seconds. So we have huge computer here. Sure. Huge. And we don't use it. We make documentary and put voiceover on top of it. Which is this is why I made is out. Because I'm sure you watch and you see. If you know have to see, you see. If you want to see, you see. You know, another aspect that really struck me was how each of the groups of animals almost immediately sought to determine the boundaries of their confinement. You see the cows all galloping until they reach the corner of the field. Um, you see the hens going right up to the fence line and trying to get through. And even Gunda gets a jolt from the electric wire. Um, you know, for the cows that now seem to be removed from agri agricultural production and in that sanctuary, we see that daily life can still be a struggle. Uh, most notably their constant exposure and harassment from the biting flies. Um, it was also notable to see the cows symbiotically pairing up to use each other's tails to try and keep the flies off their faces. Um, at sanctuaries, I've seen rescued broiler chickens still barely able to walk due to their inbreeding for rapid weight gain. You know, essentially they can escape the factory farm confines, but not the prisons of their bodies. Um, the same for the one-legged hen you feature. For me, one of the greatest strengths of the film is the way it shows that while many are familiar with the physical and psychological horrors of factory farming, here, even in the most idyllic of settings, there still is severe tragedy, emotional tragedy to animals that result from yeah. humans raising and using them for food. So what are your thoughts on the lives of such animals? Hmm. It's, it's a difficult question, right? Hmm. Yeah. That they sort of have it as, as good as it could possibly be compared to 99% of the other animals out there, but it's still a struggle. 
I will try to answer you differently. <coughs> you know, I wanted to call my film my apology mm. because uh, because I mm, I know I cannot do more than the the film. This film, I know I cannot I cannot change the situation. I know. I know it's something deep inside and in our brain and we, we refuse to think about them. And this is why my, my first goal idea was to call it apology. But then people said to me, oh, in the US, if you want to show a film in the US, you don't have a culture of apology. <laughs> I don't know if it's true, if it's not, but Very this is what I... This is what I was told. And uh, that's why I said, okay, I will, we will call it Gunda just to a point that she is not just something, but someone. And someone with, with personality. And this is why we made it black and white because hmm. in, in color, you don't see, you see more postcard image like Beautiful piglets and blue sky and gray, gray and green grass, but in black and white, black and white, you immediately focus on their eyes, and you immediately see personality, and you see different between each of them. So, <clears throat> I'm, you know, my problem is that I, I, when I finished this film, I said, oh, I have to film, I have to film other animals I have to film because it's not only right it's not only it, there are many others and they're suffering as well and but then I said mm, I cannot I can, if I will repeat myself I will um, I will spoil the I will spoil the result so you know filmmaking is not United Nation right? I'm not, um, I, I'm, ironically, on my, when I was a kid, and when I, in, in, in Russia, you have to decide about 14, 15 years, so you have to decide, or you continue to be in high school, or you go to certain career paths. And I was, I remember perfectly that day when I was deciding, when I decided that I continue to be filmmaker. So I decided, because I had two wishes, or oh, I will be ranger or someone who protect animals and protect trees. And because a lot of hunters in the forest, a lot of, and, or oh, I will be filmmaker. And then I remember that moment that I said, no, I will be filmmaker, but I will film animal. But it was difficult to convince people that I can be uh, make film about animals. It's there is no chance. It, it took me only it took me more than twenty years to find producer, to find people who, and by luck, I found uh, American co-producer Jocelyn Barnes, and then uh, Hakim Phoenix came to to help to make it more visible for public. So. It, it's, you know, one is paradox of, for example, my country. I don't know, my country, I wouldn't say Russians are very active people. We are quite lazy. Maybe we are not very curious people. And still, we came to Vladivostok, which is 10,000 kilometers from St. Petersburg and from Moscow. And paradoxically, I was never, I never understood why we are not the most enthusiastic people. We came to far away. And then I learned how we came there. Mm. I learned that for hundreds and hundred years, the main part of our budget was uh, kill, kill animals. The, the fair, the, how do you call it, fair, fair? And we sold them and we got money to our government. 
So for 100 and 100 years, now we do it with oil and with gas. And we did it before with poor animals. So that's why we go to, the hunters was going to Siberia more and more and more just to kill animals. That's why we didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. We just work same as now. We don't produce anything. We just take from the ground what we have and we sell it and we think we, this is what, this is, you see, this is so deep somewhere here, right? It's just the, the, the thinking that everything for us and we can do whatever we want, right? This is kind of ridiculous truth, yeah. Unfortunately. Well, how has the film been received so far at the film festivals and other screenings that you've done? I'm so lucky, actually. I, I was, I was so lucky that we we were in public festival. Now it's everything online, but we were lucky. We were in the last festival in Berlin Film Festival, and it was public. It was. And it was public screenings and people were sitting without masks uh, yet. And it was fantastic. And, and children were coming to microphone and asking me why I never heard about it. Why my family didn't tell me. Mm. And I said, yeah, talk to your mom, talk to your father. This is the question, right? This is the question. Why family... We give food to our kids, but we don't explain them that this food was just killed. Maybe a few days ago, it was just killed. It was alive before. And we don't want to. So I'm really, yeah, I'm so happy and I'm looking forward for, forward for cinema distribution because it is made especially in cinema language, in black and white and sound atmos sound with so it is a kind of for people who enjoy cinema this is the film to watch and uh, it's just two weeks before uh, three weeks before it will start in cinemas around the world so i'm so happy to yeah well we're getting close to the end of our time so as a final question i'd just like to ask what you would most like to see result from making this film um what type of reaction effect do you hope it will achieve yeah of course i would love to say that we will all become vegan i would love to say and i know it's probably not realistic i probably but you know you have the you you know this guy who's, who, who made the song? You, you can say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one, right? John Lennon, same yeah. He, yeah, same here. Maybe I'm a dreamer, but I believe we will have to, we have no other choice. We don't have other choice. We have to find, uh, face it. Because what we do with planet, what we do is, it's horrible. And uh, if we and we don't need to wait, United Nations to help us. We don't need when uh, Biden or Putin or Chinese president will come to agreement. We don't need pre Paris Agreement will uh, will make uh, any input. We don't need to wait. If we want to help planet, stop it, me. Just stop it right away, and thirty percent of the disaster will disappear immediately. It's so simple. You just have to stop it. All we need is less, that's all. <laughs> and we don't need to eat meat. We don't need. Look at me. I didn't eat meat since four. I'm alive, perfectly healthy. My kids have two sons. They never in their life even try anything alive. And they are healthy. So this is ridiculous wrong ideas that we need to eat. We don't need to eat meat. Look at our teeth. They, we don't have big teeth. We don't have big nails. And if, if someone say, God put us in the top of pyramid, God didn't make barbecue. God didn't in, create even pan. Did, God did not create. Uh, uh, nothing for you cooking animals. Not. 
for yeah it's yeah. I'm, I'm thank you for your time and your beautiful questions and i am privileged to talk to you of course it's a big honor for me thank you very much i feel i feel the same way and yeah i'm close this will be my 34th year since i stopped eating animals as well but um well before closing i'd just like to thank darcy and ellie at neon films and corinne at 360 degree communications for helping make this screening possible and providing this film for you all to see. Um, thank you all for joining us and please help spread the word about this important documentary so it can have the maximum impact possible. Uh, it opens on April 16th. And lastly, my own heartfelt gratitude to Victor for spending this time with us and sharing his further insights into this really meaningful and beautiful film. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Stay safe. You too.